So just a couple words on the last verse of Siksastika. Aslishiva padaratam kunastumam darsanam marma atam karotuva yatatatava vidadatu lampato matrana natastu seva nampara And in no one but Krishna is my Lord and he shall remain so even if he handles me roughly by his embrace or makes me broken hearted by not being present before me. He is completely free to do anything and everything for he is always my worshipful Lord unconditionally. This eighth verse of Shikshastika is speaking to the highest level of spiritual emotion, Mahabhava. Uh, this is experienced by uh, Krishna's uh, topmost devotees. I'm not really qualified to talk about uh, Mahabhava. Just know that there is a platform of spiritual emotion associated with loving the Supreme Lord that is experienced by his, his topmost consort, Srimati Radharani, and by her intimate associates. And that highest exchange with Krishna is on the platform of, of extreme bhava, maha bhava. And it oscillates between separation and meeting. Uh, we see here in this verse both, both things are addressed. Both the separation and the embracing is there. I want to read one thing. Uh, in regards to the six sastika as as a whole, and then speak a little bit about the significance of what's available uh, through Lord Chaitanya's mercy. This verse, uh, this book, six sastika, is Tripurari Swami's commentary on these eight verses, and he ends his work with the following paragraph: Devotees rejoice. Gora composed the eight verses of Siksastikam for the purpose of advertising the purest love. And after composing them, Gora tasted that love in Siksastikam's final stanza and invited the whole world to do the same. Sri Siksastikam should be recited daily and its deep meaning should be contemplated over and over again. These eight verses of Gora Krishna Awaken Shraddha in the sadhana of Nama Sankirtan and give bhakti in sequential steps culminating in Vraja Prema. Blessed are those who take advantage of it. May they bless me by allowing me to follow in their footsteps. The Krishna consciousness movement coming down from Sri Shaitanya is an extremely rare opportunity for those suffering within the material world. Krishna states in Bhagavad Gita, yada yada hi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata. Whenever and wherever there's a decline of religion, he comes himself. That also includes when he empowers someone with his energy to get humanity back on track. So we see in the advent of Lord Krishna, 5,000 years ago, the earth was overburdened by corrupt leadership. 5,000 years ago, Krishna came himself to put things straight. And we can see that throughout history, Krishna is coming either himself in various incarnations, or he empowers someone. These empowered living entities, I mean, all of us are part and parcel of the Supreme Lord. Whatever we are is... The essence of our existence is a small particle of the Supreme. He can, even with the smallest infinitesimal particle, give unlimited energies. So we see various religious leaders uh, coming throughout history to uplift humanity. But the opportunity available by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is truly an extraordinary occurrence. First of all, extraordinary in the fact that it only happens once in a day of Brahma. Brahma is the creator of the universe. And Brahma lives for a long time. <laughs> but we couldn't calculate his whole life. Let's say he lives, they say, Veda tells us Brahma lives a hundred years. Every one of those years has 365 days, and every one of those days has a daytime and a nighttime. 
So let's talk about something to give a little perspective. During one day of Brahma, there are 1,000 cycles of the four yugas of man, the four ages of man, Satya, Treta, Dwarpa, and Kali. Those four ages of man equal 4,320,000 years taken together. Those four times a thousand. Brahma's daytime is 4,320,000,000 of our years. His one day. And that's when he does his creation. And then in the evening he takes rest for 4,320,000,000 years. One of his days, 24 hours, is 8 billion of our years. That's one day. He lives 365 days in a year times 100. Gives you an idea of Brahma's lifespan. Let's go back to a day. 8 billion of our years. Once in a day of Brahma, Krishna personally comes, the original Supreme Lord in his original form, once in a day of Brahma. And it's in the Shastra, it tells us exactly when. He comes during the, the seventh Manu, every Manu. Manu is, is the controller in charge of humanity, human, and kind. Manu, there are 14 Manus. Each Manu is in charge of 71 Yuga cycles. Yuga cycle is those four Yugas, and he's in charge of 71 of those, and there's 14 Manus. During the seventh Manu, about noontime for Brahma, middle of the day, during the seventh Manu, that 28th cycle of Yugas, at the junction between Dwarfa Yuga and Kali Yuga. Four Yugas, Satcha, Treta, Dwarpa, and Kali. Between Dwarpa and Kali Yuga, the 28th cycle of Yugas during the 7th Manu, who is in charge of 71, four Yugas together, that's when Krishna comes in his original form. Yes. In where we are now, in which year in the life of Brahma? I mean, is this every, every, day. every day in the life oh, of Brahma? Every day. Every okay. day. What's that? Oh, which, oh. We're in the same Manu. We are in the we are in the seventh Manu, Vaivashwata Manu. We're in the same Manu. We're in the same cycle of yugas when Krishna came. Krishna was just here. The original Supreme Personality of Godhead was just here 5,000 years ago. <laughs> Darn, we just missed them. We just missed them. <laughs> After Krishna comes in his original form, once in the day of Brahma, in the same Kali Yuga, which begins after Krishna departs, when Krishna leaves, the next yuga begins, Kali Yuga begins. As I said, he comes between Dwarpa Yuga and Kali Yuga. When he departs, then Kali comes in. And this is the last and most degraded age of mankind. Now, in that Kali Yuga, after Krishna's appearance, Krishna comes again in the disguised form. He comes, the original Lord again, not an incarnation, not a partial representation, not, a, um, not an amsa, a little particle. No, the Supreme Lord comes again. Krishna comes again in the Kali Yuga after his appearance at the end of the Dwarpa Yuga. Y'all following this? Got this? Okay. He comes again, the same original supreme personality of Godhead, but he comes in the disguise of a devotee. He comes in the emotion of his topmost devotee. He comes with the intention of understanding that spiritual emotion. And that emotion is the emotion of Srimata Radharani. That's what, that is what he comes to experience. But he's hidden. He hides himself. 
So instead of coming in his original color, which is that of sham, rain cloud, he comes in a golden hue. And he doesn't want people to know he's here because he's come with the purpose of engaging in the process of bhakti in the emotion of Radha to taste what is it that Radha sees in me? What is it? What attracts her to me? I want to know that. She's the topmost devotee and her love for me, it, it, it's intriguing. How can she be that much in love with me? That I want to know. That's what he wants to know. Now, in coming as a devotee and disguising himself, Krishna is trying to taste that highest emotion. But he really can't disguise himself from his devotees. Because his devotees, his topmost associates, Radharani's, topmost servitors, the topmost manjaris, those that arrange for loving exchange between the Lord and his consort, they also detect him. And those topmost lovers appear at the time of Lord Chaitanya as the Goswamis. Now, as soon as Lord Chaitanya finds that the Goswamis, they're coming to him and they're saying, you are the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He covers his ears. I don't want to, I'm not God. No. <laughs> I'm just a devotee. How you could call me God? But they know, they can find. Immediately what he does in order to further disguise himself is that love that he came to taste, that highest sentiment of devotional service of Srimati Radharani, he immediately takes that storehouse of love and begins to distribute it to humanity. Hoping that in distributing that love to humanity, he will not be found out. A very unique situation comes in the, in the wake of that. And the uniqueness of that situation is that humanity, mankind, in this Kali Yuga, when Sri Shaitanya Mahaprabhu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead in his original form, covered with the emotion of his topmost lover, when he comes in this Kali Yuga, after he's invented in his original form as Krishna, he distributes the most intimate spiritual knowledge of his topmost loving exchanges with his supermost devotees freely to mankind despite the fact that Kali Yuga is the most degraded age and no one is a fit recipient. We have no qualifications for this gift. It's quite an amazing thing. So this magnificent Krishna consciousness movement and these eight stanzas which give us a summary of the progression in spiritual life from having just a particle of faith, a tashrada tata sadhu, a particle of faith, a tashrada tata sadhu, and the association of Krishna's most intimate devotees, specifically the bona fide spiritual master who manifests externally. This good fortune is distributed and summarized our advancement is summarized step by step by Lord Chaitanya in these eight stanzas. So that's why it's so very important that we understand their significance and that we chant them weekly, daily, hourly. I mean, we need, this is it. This is, what a rare opportunity. Who would not take advantage of this? We have no qualification normally to advance in devotional service takes hundreds of lifetimes 
what to speak of even coming to the platform of being recognized. Krishna gives liberation freely to those that want free from material miseries. Liberation is easily available. But he never gives to pure devotion. So very rare that he gives someone himself. Because that what, that's what it means. To be at the platform of pure devotional service means that the Supreme Lord is willing to accept our love unconditionally. But in order to have that rare opportunity, we have to come to the unconditional platform of giving our love. And that's summed up in this eighth verse. Aslishiva padavutam punastuma, madarsana mama hatam kurutuva, yitatitava vidadatu lampato, matrana natastu se eva napara. I'll read Triparari's translation. He may embrace me, devoted as I am to his feet, or he may torment me and break my heart by hiding from me. Being a playboy, he is free to do whatever he likes, for he alone is the Lord of my life. There's a lot of esoteric meaning here, especially in the last four stanzas of the Sixastika. When someone is it enters into a heartfelt revelation of these last four stanzas, his actual spiritual relationship with the Supreme Lord becomes manifest in his heart. That means how we personally love Krishna will be manifest to us as we advance progressively. So are there any questions? Hmm? I'm ending Sixastica. You would think uh, you would think that uh, Krishna would get eventually exhausted for coming and going, coming and going, going and get you know correcting mankind. You know, you'd be exhausted. <laughs> you know, it's like why can't you guys learn the first time? You know, keep killing yourselves. You know. I was just reading in Chaitanya Charitamrita this morning. Uh, there's a discussion there between uh, Hari Das Thakur, Namacharya, and Sanatan Goswami and Lord Chaitanya. They're having a discussion. Now, preliminary to this, the discussion begins because Sanatan Goswami had, in coming to Jagannath Puri to meet with Lord Chaitanya, he'd gone through the forest and in going through the forest he'd taken some water that was contaminated and he got a disease. And the symptoms of the disease were that he got sores on his body. And of course those sores, they were putting out some undesirable substances. <laughs> and he was, with these oozing sores, he began to think of how greatly offensive he was in the fact that he was with Lord Chaitanya. And being with Lord Chaitanya, Lord Chaitanya was so kind to him that despite his disease, Lord Chaitanya would always, when he saw him, embrace him. And of course, the, the, the liquid from his body, from those sores, would get on, on Krishna, on, on Sri Chaitanya. So he was like, I can't go on like this. Every time I see Lord Chaitanya, he's embracing me and I'm committing unlimited offenses because he's embracing my diseased body. He was thinking in this way and he was so distraught, he wanted to take his life. Well, Lord Chaitanya wouldn't have anything to do with it. He said, you're my devotee. And it's not your body to do with as you please. You've given it to me. You've surrendered to me as a devotee, and therefore your body is mine. After he had, had settled that in some earlier chapters of Chaitanya Charitamrita, 
And Lord Chaitanya continued to embrace him every time they saw him. And Lord Chaitanya came every day to the hut of Haridas Thakur where Sanatan Goswami was staying. Both Haridas Thakur and Sanatan Goswami, Haridas Thakur was born into a Mohammedan family. And Sanatan Goswami, although born into a high-placed Brahmana family, had worked in the government of Mohammedans. So both of them were considered fallen by the Brahminical standard of society. Therefore, they weren't allowed to go to the temple. <laughs> and they weren't allowed in. Just like any of you, if you ever go to Jagannath Puri, you're not going to get in the temple. Maybe you can disguise yourself. Some Ishkhan members have tried that. I think a couple were successful, but not many have pulled it off. They're supposed to be changing the law now, though. Oh. Until the laws change, you're not going to get in. Back then... Both Haridas and Sanatan Goswami weren't allowed to the temple. So they lived in a hut some distance away, but they could see the, the chakra, the Krishna's symbol on the top of the temple. Looks like a wheel. In that way, they could worship Lord Jagannath, who resided in the temple. But every day, Lord Chaitanya went to the temple, and then he brought prasadam from the temple to, to Haridas and Sanatan Goswami. And this is the best prasadam there is, quite unique. So Sanatan Goswami determined, well, Lord Chaitanya continues to show his mercy upon me, but I'm, again, I'm, I'm, I'm being offensive, but I can't take my body. So he, he consulted with another Vaishnav, who was Jagadananda. Jagadananda was a young new devotee, and... Because of his position, he really shouldn't have been giving advice to Sanatan Goswami, who was his sen senior in devotional qualification. I, I believe he was also his senior in age at that time. But he, in speaking with Jagannanda, uh, Sanatan Goswami inquired from him, what should I do? It, would it be all right for me to go back to Vrindavan? And... That way I won't be near Lord Chaitanya and if I'm not here, he won't embrace me and if he doesn't embrace me, then my body won't ooze on him and if I don't ooze on him, then I'll be not committing the level of offenses that I think are destroying my life and going to be sending me you know, into a hellish condition for, for hundreds of lifetimes. This was his consciousness as a devotee. He was thinking like this. He made a determination, I'm going to Vrindavan. I'm going to return to Vrindavan. And he told this to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And Sri Chaitanya, when he heard this, he said, uh, Jaga, referring to Jaga Ananda, is not in a position to give you advice. <laughs> he should be hearing from you. I'm not ready for you to go to Vrindavan. As they continued to, to have a discourse, Lord Chaitanya spoke quite intimately uh, with Haridas Thakur and Sanatan Goswami. And he revealed that his sentiment for devotees such as them is the same sentiment as a father would have for their son. The same sentiment. I look upon you. I look upon your activities and devotional service and I can see no fault on your part. In the purport to that, one of the purports to one of those verses, Prabhupada makes a comparison. Now, of course, remember this, Lord Chaitanya is saying this to Sanatan Goswami in order to placate him because he continues to embrace him. And he says, no, I look at you exactly as, as a father would look at his child or a mother would look at their child. When the child passes some stool or urine and it gets on the body of the mother, do you think it upsets her in any way? No. She sees no difference between that ornament from her child and sandalwood paste. Sandalwood paste they wear in India. It's a very fragrant and uh, nice substance. He said, I am a sannyasi anyway. And because I am a sannyasi, I should see no difference between mud in the ground and sandalwood paste. 
I have to have that equanimity of mind when I've accepted the renounced order of life. I see nothing at all offensive by anything that would come to my body from embracing you. The point being that this is the way that Krishna sees his devotees, just like his children. And when you have a child, they can do no wrong, even if they're doing big wrong. You come to their aid, no matter what they do, no matter what trouble they get themselves in, you're there to bail them out. So you said, doesn't Krishna become tired coming back and forth trying to rectify us. Well, it seems like a lot of work. It's, you know. and, <laughs> and when the mother or father cares for the child, are they ever fatigued? No. See, no. I was thinking that in terms of being counterproductive. That's our fault. <laughs> but Krishna is so merciful and so kind. Mm -hmm. When he completed Bhagavad Gita, what did he say to Arjuna? Did you get it? Did you get it? If you didn't get it, it I'll again. explain the whole thing to you again. That's Krishna's relationship with his devotees. Is there a time when uh, Krishna actually comes to, uh, to uh, make uh, humanity progress? Or just... Yeah. Krishna yada, yada, he dharma, shya. When's he come? Yeah. He says in Bhagavad Gita, whenever and wherever there's a decline in religious practice and a predominance of irreligion. Well, then you could say, well, wow, look around. Yeah. I mean, look. If, there, if there's ever a time of a predominance of irreligion, isn't this it? Where's Krishna? But Krishna is here in his holy name. His holy name and himself are non-different. Mm -hmm. He personally came 500 years ago and inaugurated this movement of chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. There, that mantra, this Hare Krishna movement, this Krishna consciousness movement, this Sankirtan movement inaugurated by Lord Chaitanya is in itself sufficient to rectify all the problems that are here today. Well, you can say, I don't see that it's rectifying the problems. Imagine what it would be like if there was no Krishna consciousness movement here today. We can't, we don't know. So just because of our mundane vision, we're not seeing how effective this movement is. You're saying, well, here I am in this city. I don't know how many people live in Winston-Salem you know, a couple hundred thousand, or I don't even know what the population is. You could say, well, there's a, there's a handful of people here, and sometimes you have a Sunday feast, and sometimes devotees come from places elsewhere, and this, in this whole city of Winston-Salem, you know, there's only two or three homes where devotees are chanting every day, and, you know, there's, there's not a lot of temples <coughs> for Krishna. So, it doesn't seem like it's having a, uh, any effect. It's having an effect. We need to know that. It's having an effect. This Krishna consciousness movement is only 500 years old. It's only beginning. This period of Lord Chaitanya's movement is going to go on for another 9,500 years. It's going to increase in influence. It's a long time. 9,500 years. Jesus was here how long ago? 2,000. There's another 9,000 years of this, what do we used to sing in the 60s? The age of Aquarius. <laughs> this period of Sri Chaitanya's influence is going to be very significant. The fact that it, it ebbs and flows through the populations of the planet now. We notice the Krishna consciousness movement is going like waves over the planet. Some place the wave is very high, like now if you go into, into European areas, there's huge festivals, thousands of devotees. Or if you take a flight out to uh, Utah, a little thing with your mouse and you click on YouTube, uh, go to the Festival of Colors, 
He just had a festival in Utah, the temple out there. I I don't even know what you went. How many people go to that? I didn't know this year. Maybe over ten thousand. Over ten thousand. Wow. You know, festival. In Utah. In Utah. In Utah. Yes. <laughs> Mormon cu- and all the Mormon kings are there. All of them. Wow. Throwing colors on each other and listening to Krishna consciousness rock music. <laughs> so there's an ebb and flow of this Krishna consciousness movement. In due course, the waves of this movement will fully inundate the whole and everyone will be taking advantage of this chanting. It's just a matter of time. And of course, we can also see, and Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, that four kinds of men approach him. Four people begin their spiritual life. Who are those? Those who are distressed, those in want of money, those that are inquisitive, and the wise man. The person that has some spiritual intelligence. They approach Krishna. Well, as we can see, we mentioned this many times, in the foxhole, how many atheists are there? They may be an atheist their whole life, but when they're in the foxhole and the bullets are flying over their head, they're praying. They know God then. Similarly, we can see also that there'll be times, just as there has been many times in the past, what we look at as as current history, many times that humanity's been suffering, you know, you have someone like a Hitler come forward and and try to show his dominance over the world and the suffering of humanity at that time. Or even you look to third world countries now. I think I just saw something on uh, Haiti, you know, cholera epidemic in in the wake of a, uh, was it a flood we had there, I think. Great suffering. And we can see also, in, even in this prosperous United States of America, things are changing. Prosperity may not last that much longer here. We may become the third world Haiti in the next 50, 100 years. Then the consciousness of humanity changes and that opens the door for Lord Chaitanya's Sankirtan movement truly a benediction. You'd say, oh, suffering? You've got to be suffering. You have to suffer to become aware and conscious of the Supreme. Sometimes in suffering, that's the time we make the greatest spiritual advancement. We lose a loved one and we cry out. And immediately in that crying out to the Supreme, no matter what our faith or religion may be, we feel that there is some buddy they're hearing, don't we? That it is, there is some comfort in that crying out. And once we realize that that relationship is quintessential in our existence, it trumps all the relationships we can have that are temporary in this material plane. And then we're so fortunate as to come in contact with a source of very potent spiritual knowledge, unadulterated, coming down purely, like Prabhupada when he came some 40 years ago. What a personality. When we have that opportunity to hear pure knowledge from Krishna's pure devotees, then our hearts will open up. I'm going to try to wrap up the introduction to Bhagavad Gita. And next week we're going to have a guest My godbrother Narantara, he's kind of like a minstrel. He's a very good speaker, gives an excellent class. And he also likes to do a little storytelling with his guitar. So uh, please uh, come if you can, bring as many people. He's kind of unique. You can um, type it? I can send you a link and you can watch it right now. (laughs) Okay. So at this point, in the introduction, Prabhupada is giving us a glimpse of the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita in relationship to that transcendental realm of eternal life. The Lord resides eternally in his abode Goloka. 
yet he can be approached from this world. And to this end, the Lord comes to manifest his real form, Satchitananda Vigraha. Svara Paramakrishna Satchitananda Vigraha Nadira Dir Govinda Sarvakarna Karanam. Then, when he manifests this form, there is no need for our imagining what he looks like. Just like when we were chanting before our session, to give some imaginary interpretation to the holy name is an offense. So similarly, we shouldn't try to speculate, well, what's God like? He'll tell us. He tells us what he's like. Exactly what he's like. To discourage such imaginative speculation, he descends and exhibits himself as he is, as Simon Sundar. And when does he descend? How often? Once in the day of Brahma. Once in the day of Brahma. He comes in his original form. Now he also comes in other incarnations, but the other incarnations that Krishna comes in, and there's unlimited incarnations that display unlimited characteristics of the Supreme and have unlimited pastimes for the benefit of the living entities in this material world. But they don't display all of the Lord's potencies. He has specific characteristics in his form as Sama Sundar, in his original form, that form from which all other incarnations come. And he comes once in a day of Brahma, and then we can know this is the Supreme Lord. Is it possible that uh, Krishna comes as, as an animal? Yes. Rather than a man. But... He comes in every species of life. Bhagavatam explains and that. And people yet recognize that? No, but... You don't have to recognize Krishna to be benefited by his association. Some may recognize, some may not recognize. Mm -hmm. Krishna's pure devotees always recognize, and humanity at large always gets it wrong. They never, God can be amongst them, they don't know. When Krishna came, hardly anybody recognized him as the supreme personality of Godhead. Very few. Right. But everyone benefited by his association. That's part of his disguise, like you mentioned earlier. As, well, Sri Chaitanya, yes. But it's part of it's. It's due to what? It's due to the fact that we don't have spiritual vision. Without spiritual vision, if, our, if, if we're covered by material energy and covered by material desire, then we're not going to have spiritual eyes. We can't see. In Bhagavad Gita... Arjuna wanted to see Krishna's universal form. And he said, well, you don't, have the, you don't have the eyes to see. So let me give you the eyes to see. And then Arjuna could see the universal form. And after he saw it, how Krishna, how God is, how his energy comes from him and encompasses everything that we experience. It was like, could you turn it off? It's like, this is, I can't handle this. Uh, every living entity is entering into your fire, fiery mouths and dying and you're extended everywhere and all the planets are within you and it's a very scary thing to see how the Lord is, that this, what's he say? Time I am destroyer of everything. In this material plane, we're all destroyed and because we're, our consciousness is here in these temporary bodies. It's very scary for us to see how time is eating us all up. It's not so scary in life because we go through it one day at a time. But when you see it in relationship with the Supreme Lord, poof, it's over in a heartbeat. Hundreds of lifetimes. Arjuna said, please, that's it. I've seen enough. Can I see you as I love you? Can I see you in your two-handed form? Krishna first came, showed him his Vishnu form again, and then he showed himself in his original form. Prabhupada goes on. The Brahma Jyoti emanates from the supreme abode, Krishna Loka, and the Ananda Maya, Chinmaya planets, which are not material, float in those rays. 
So what Prabhupada is doing here, as he goes towards the end of his introduction, is he's giving us some insight into what is that spiritual realm of eternity, knowledge, and bliss. We have experience of this material realm. We can see what's here, some of it, some little portion of it. Now, Prabhupada is giving us some insight into what is the spiritual world like. He's saying everything's resting on the energy of the Supreme, the Brahma Jyoti. There's no need for a sun or a moon or a, a, a light bulb. Everything's illumined naturally but from that Brahma Jyoti, which is coming, that energy, that light from the Supreme Lord. And living entities are traveling from one planet to another, but it is not that we, we can go to any planet we like merely by a mechanical arrangement. Then he explains within the material universe, Yanti Deva Vrata Devan Pitrin Yanti Pitri Vrata. Simple explanation. In this plane of existence, we can see there are so many planets in the night sky. And we may have a desire to go to those planets. And we can see that we even build some contraption and try to go there. Or say we went there. We want to go to the moon. But even if we went to the moon, let's say mankind did go to the moon. Of course, understand that according to the Veda, the moon is actually further away than the sun, not closer. Be that as it may. <laughs> what, let's say we want to go to the sun. Can we go there? Not in this body. Be burnt to ashes. Rahu. <laughs> Mars. So many planets. We may want to make some material arrangement, some mechanical arrangement and try to go to these planets. Whether it be the moon or the sun or Jupiter or Saturn or Mars or whatever. But there's a, there's a way that we can. Krishna gives us a way in Bhagavad Gita 925. Yanti Deva Vrata Devan Pitrin Yanti Pitri Vrata. That knowledge is also in Bhagavad Gita. Krishna is also giving that. If you want to go to any one of the planets, every planet has a predominating owner, demigod. Just like if I wanted to go to some rich man's island. He owned the whole thing. But generally people in that level, you're not just going to drive up in your, in, in your boat and it'll be allowed entrance. It's going to be protected. It's going to be guarded. Similarly, the higher planetary systems are guarded by material nature naturally, and there is a natural way to go there. You worship the owner of the planet. Want to go to the moon? Worship Chandra. He's the god of the moon. In your next life, you can go. He'll say, come. You worship me? Fine. I'll let you enter. Want to go to the sun? Fine. Worship Sura. Sura is the god of the sun. You worship him during your life? At the end of life, come. It's okay. I grant you entrance. Any planet in the material universe we want to attain, we can attain by following Vedic directions, scriptural directions, and worshiping the predominating deity of that planet. Prabhupada goes on to explain, though, as explained in Bhagavad Gita, from the highest planet to the lower planet, lowest planet in the material world, every place is full of misery. It may not seem so miserable in comparison with what we experience here, but in comparison with spiritual existence, it's miserable. Why? Spiritual existence has characteristics of what? Sat, Chit, Ananda. Eternity, knowledge, and bliss. When there's death, old age, change of the body... No spiritualist is interested in any of that, whether he be on the highest planet or the lowest, whether he live for a thousand years or a hundred thousand years or simply a hundred years on this planet. None of that is of any interest to someone who knows his true spiritual nature. If our nature is eternal, full of knowledge and bliss, why would we want any existence independent of experiencing that to the fullest degree? That's what Krishna consciousness movement's about. That's why Krishna gives humanity the Bhagavad Gita so that we can learn this knowledge and know of our true nature. 
He begins very simply, doesn't the second chapter? Never was there a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings, nor in the future shall any of us cease to be. Matras Sparsas to count a, uh, the non-appearance, the non-permanent appearance of happiness and distress and their disappearance in due course is like the appearance of the, the different seasons. They're, they're not permanent. Prabhupada gives some indication. And then he mentions, as long as we do not give up this propensity for lording it over material nature, there is no possibility of returning to the kingdom of the Supreme, the Sanatan Dharma. I think we more or less covered Sanatan Dharma pretty thoroughly last week, right? Remember, sanatan is eternal, dharma, occupational engagement. As long as we want to engage here by being lord and master of all we survey, we're not going to be able to regain entrance into Satchitananda. The spiritual world already has a god, and we're not it. That god's Krishna. He's the supreme person there. If we still have a desire to enjoy like God, then we got to stay here. This is our God place. We can pretend to be God here forever. Of course, we're not ever going to be God, but we can sure think we're God. I got the fastest car. I got the most buff body. I got all the women coming around me. I'm the best movie star. I have the most money. I have the biggest brain, I, have, I pay, play the best uh, you know, flute, I, I'm the best artist, I'm the best sculpture. Where does it end? I can be God of so many things in this world. Then I can be a different kind of God. Then a different one. Eternally, this body, that body, I get tired of being that kind of God, I can be the next God. I wanted to be the the best, richest person. I did that. Now I want to be the most famous person. Did that. Now I want to be the strongest person. Most renounced person. I want to be the highest. I want to be the best yogi. I want to have all the yoga cities. I want to become a small. I want to be able to fly to any planet I want. I want to be able to leave through the top of my head. And with my mystic power, I want to be able to create my own planets. No problem. You can have all that here. But you can't go to that place where every bit of your existence is fully satisfied. That place of eternal love. That place where all speaking is song and all movement is dance. And where Krishna is the, is the central point of everyone's loving relationship. So that love you cannot have here. But you can have so many other things. You choose. At the end of Bhagavad Gita, what does Krishna say? I've told you, I've given you all this knowledge. Now you decide, either you want to surrender to me, or you want to throw your bow down and go off to the forest and listen to you, your, you know, your own, make your own determination. The body is also Naranda. Narananda. Instead of being full of bliss, it is full of misery. That not only applies to us, it also applies to those in the higher planetary systems. Of course, their misery is a lot less noticeable to them. But even in that higher realm where the physical body is it's much more subtle. In fact, when the demigods come down to this plane, they could be here in the room, we wouldn't be able to see them. They can come, they can manifest themselves. We just don't have the fine spiritual sense to be able to perceive them. Can't they sort of look down upon us? They can do whatever they want. They have all the mystic opulences. Mm -hmm. Higher authorities, not the living entity himself, make this decision. We're talking about what happens after death. This life is a preparation for the next life. Prabhupada goes on to explain that the material world is one-fourth of Krishna's full manifestation of energy. The material world is one-quarter, and the spiritual world is three-quarters. One-quarter of unlimited is 
pretty big, and three quarters of unlimited is even bigger. I mean, Krishna's energies are just inconceivable. In all cases, they enter the spiritual sky, but only the devotee or he who is in personal touch with the Supreme Lord enters into the Vaikuntha planets or the Galoka Vrindavan planets. So Prabhupada is going on to, to point out that we can leave the material realm and enter the spiritual sky, but we cannot enter the spiritual planets in the spiritual sky without a personal conception of the Lord. Prabhupada writes something very uh, nice here. He says, The Lord further adds that of this there is no doubt. This must be believed firmly. We should not reject that which does not tally with our imagination. Our attitude should be that of Arjuna. I believe everything that you have said. Now this is in relationship. Prabhupada has pointed out prior to this that if we simply understand Krishna, if we simply understand his nature, if we simply understand his position, if we do that, we do not have to take birth again in this material world. And some may say, well, that's just too easy. Well, if Krishna is God, the most simple things can become impossible and the most difficult things can be easily attained. goes on to explain Krishna's different energies. Everybody's read this introduction a few times since we've been going over it, right? Prabhupada gives some nice concluding remark. And what really caught me was the fact that what is our duty in relationship to Bhagavad Gita? One place Prabhupada says, we must always engage our minds in reading Vedic literature. In other words, if we want to become Krishna conscious, if we want to attain spiritual consciousness, we're going to have to give up associating and having our minds involved in materially conscious things. We have to absorb our mind in thought of Krishna. The difficulty for us in that, we just don't know how sweet those thoughts are to us. Because of our conditioning, we don't realize how sweet it is to be completely immersed in thought of Krishna perpetually. It's hard for us to even chant a few rounds, 16 rounds a day. It's like, am I ever going to get these done? But if you were actually hearing your rounds and experiencing Krishna in his holy names, you'd be completely saturated with spiritual enjoyment. Again, remember, we're in a jaundiced condition. What is sweet tastes bitter. When you have jaundice, sugar tastes bitter. But as you take more sugar to cure the disease, the sweetness becomes apparent to you. So that's the way it is. Uh, in that way, it will be possible for us to remember the Supreme Lord at the time of death. If we immerse our life in hearing about Krishna throughout our lives, reading the Vedas, chanting Hare Krishna, associating with devotees, serving Krishna in some way. Of this there is no doubt. Tasmat sarveshu kaleshu. Therefore, Arjuna, you should always think of me in the form of Krishna. Not in many of other... Krishna comes in many forms, but let's concentrate on that original supreme manifestation of the Lord Sama Sundar. And at the same kind, continue your prescribed duty of fighting with your activities dedicated to me and your mind and intelligence fixed on me, you will attain me without doubt. Molding our life's activities in such a way that we can remember him always. And again, I realize it may seem like it's difficult, but once we become absorbed in Krishna consciousness and we begin we, every week we read Shiksastika and it's a progression and the progression is from a little difficult in the beginning to a fact that we actually develop a taste Nista, Ruchi a taste continually when we read we have a taste when we chant we have a taste when we taste prasada, we have a big taste at least I do Similarly, we should always remember the supreme lover, Sri Krishna, and at the same time perform our material duties. But we have to develop that sense of love. Activities in spiritual life 
without that sense of love simply a religion. And religion is just a bunch of rules and regulations. And it, you won't stick with it very long. Eventually you get tired of that. But if there's love underneath, and if our love is actually blossoming through this chanting and through this immersion in Vedic knowledge, knowledge of Krishna, then it's ever increasing in pleasure. Yogi namapi sarve sam matgate nan taratmana sharavan bhajate yo mam same yukta tamomata. Of all yogis, the one with great faith who always abides in me thinks of me within himself and renders transcendental loving service to me is the most intimately united with me in yoga and is the highest of all. That is my opinion. The supermost jnani, the supermost yogi, and the greatest devotee is one that thinks of Krishna at all times. Then Prabhupada goes on at the end of one paragraph. He says, The secret of Bhagavad Gita, this whole study of Bhagavad Gita is for one purpose. Total absorption in thought of Sri Krishna. Before ending the introduction, he, he tells us that we must, if we want to learn Bhagavad Gita, we must learn it from an experienced person. An experienced person. Someone who is a practicing devotee. Tadvidi pranipatena. If we want to learn the truth, we have to approach someone who knows the truth. Not This is not an academic exercise. It's a nice sentence near the end. Prabhupada says, If one complete, properly follows the instructions of Bhagavad Gita, one can be freed from all miseries and anxieties in this life, and one's next life will be spiritual. Anybody here not want to sign up for that? All miseries? Can you imagine being misery-free? No anxiety? If one reads Bhagavad Gita very sincerely and with all seriousness, then by the grace of the Lord, the reactions of his past misdeeds will not act upon him. Prabhupada's giving a lot of benedictions here in this introduction at the end. This one book, Bhagavad Gita, will suffice because it is the essence of all Vedic literatures. And especially because it was spoken by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Here at the end of his introduction, Prabhupada is quoting verse after verse of the Gita Mahatmya, which is simply a glorification of Bhagavad Gita. One who drinks the water of the Ganges attains salvation. So what to speak of one who drinks the nectar of Bhagavad Gita? Bhagavad Gita is the essence of is the essential nectar of the Mahabharata and it is spoken by Lord Krishna himself, the original v Vishnu. Again, from the Gita Mahatmya. And this is Prabhupada's grand ending. In the present day, people are very much eager to have one scripture, one God, one religion, and one occupation. Therefore, ekam sastram devakiputra gitam. Let there be one scripture only. One common scripture for the whole world, Bhagavad Gita. Eko devo devaki putra eva. Let there be one God for the whole world, Sri Krishna. Eko mantras tasya namani. And one hymn, one mantra, one prayer, the chanting of his name. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. Karma ye kam tasya devasya seva. And let there be one work only, the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Any questions? Thank you so much. I'm sorry I went so over. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.